On July 6, 1925, an attorney named Thomas Blackwelder was awakened by a knock at the door. When he opened it, his neighbor, James Pink Chaffin, was looking somewhat flustered. Chaffin asked him if he could go with him to his brother's house. He needed to find something at that house and required the attorney to be a witness. The attorney, somewhat taken aback, said, you have to tell me what this is all about before I go anywhere with you. Chaffin looked him in the eyes and said, there's a will, a will my father wrote, and it's hidden in an old Bible. How do you know that? The attorney asked. Your pop's been dead for almost four years. I know, said Chaffin, because he told me last night. And guess what, folks? The will was there. We guess we should finish the story. It is, after all, one of the most well-known ghost stories in the US. Some people have heard it and have decided ghosts are indeed a real thing. The father who died was James L. Chaffin of Monksville, North Carolina, a farmer who worked hard for many years and accrued land and property. In 1921, he had an accident and died. Surprisingly for some, everything in his will went to just one of his four sons, Marshall. That will was dated 1905. Marshall was said to have been the dead man's favorite son, and so while the other sons, Abner, John, and James Jr. were understandably a bit upset, they didn't contest the will. Marshall and his wife got everything. Then in 1925, James said he started having crazy dreams that seemed just a little bit too real. In those dreams, his father came to him and said he had written a second will and hidden it, and in that will he left everything to all the sons. James later said, I was fully convinced that my father's spirit had visited me for the purpose of explaining some mistake. His father's ghost told him to go look in his old coat, the one he was wearing when he came to him in ghost form. James and the attorney went to Marshall's house where the coat was stored in an attic. Sewn into one of the pockets was a note. It read, read the 27th chapter of Genesis in my daddy's old Bible. When they discovered the Bible, in that chapter two pages had been folded together. Within those pages was the will. It was dated January 16, 1919. Part of it read, I want, after giving my body a decent burial, my little property to be equally divided between my four children, if they are living at my death, both personal and real estate divided equal if not living, given share to their children. The case went to the court because it had to be decided if the will was indeed real. During the proceedings, people were shocked to hear James's story of the ghost. A judge later ruled that the second will was valid. But you have to ask the question, why would the father have created a kind of puzzle to solve? Why not just tell James where the will was? That was what some of the skeptical public asked, and is what the Society for Psychical Research asked when they got on the case. Any of you down-to-earth folks are likely assuming that James and his brothers concocted an elaborate plan, and at least one of them tried in earnest to copy his father's signature. They then waited for the right time to hide the note in the pocket and stuff the will between the tattered Bible pages, but at least a few of you will have felt a chill run down your back when hearing the story. You people might give credence to the possibility of the existence of ghosts. You wouldn't be alone. Polls differ from year to year, but most of the time when people answer polls, the results show that between 40 and 50 percent of people in the USA believe in ghosts. A 2019 YouGov America poll said 45 percent, with slightly more people believing in demons and only 13 percent of participants believing in vampires. A YouGov poll in the UK said 34 percent of people there believe in ghosts. Nine percent of people that answered said they'd actually seen or communicated with one. These are pretty high numbers, but head over to, say, East Asia, and the very mention of ghosts can make people's knees tremble. The skeptics watching this are now thinking, why? Why do those people believe in things that science cannot prove are there? Do they also believe in tooth fairies and goblins? Well, for a start, humans have done a lot of believing in unscientific things through the ages. Maybe if a guy like James turned up in an American court these days and claimed to have talked to the apparition of his dead dad, the whole place would erupt in laughter. But wait a minute, don't people say in court all the time, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Nobody would laugh at that. Science cannot prove God exists either. That's why religious people talk about faith. Faith can be powerful. It can pretty much define a person's life and even define how they die. In Dr. Michael Shermer's book, The Believing Brain, he asserts that humans are hardwired to believe in a kind of top-down system. That's the same as having faith in an omniscient being or beings. We can't seem to live without it. He talks about something called patternicity, which is when we find meanings and patterns that might be meaningless. He also talks about something called agenticity, when we give patterns meanings and agency. According to him, this is how that pans out. Once beliefs are formed, the brain begins to look for and find confirmatory evidence in support of those beliefs, which adds an emotional boost of further confidence in the beliefs and thereby accelerates the process of reinforcing them and round and round the process goes in a positive feedback loop of belief confirmation. And that's why we have faith in things that aren't there, or at least that we can't see. Whether we're talking about Zeus, God Almighty, Satan, Thor, or a ghost known as Pret or Preta, 
which has scared the hell out of billions of Asian kids for years, and still does now. If people believe in ghosts, studies have shown that they are more than likely to say they have seen a ghost. For instance, a study in the UK involved one of the country's so-called haunted places. The study found that people who believed in ghosts reported hearing and seeing what could have been a ghost more than people that didn't believe in ghosts. The force is strong in those that believe it. Another study showed that people who believed in ghosts tended to have first embraced that belief not because they saw one, but because they had been told ghosts exist by a source or person they believed in. Once something is implanted in childhood, it's not easy to remove later. To sum this up, humans are hardwired to believe in something outside of their earthly existence. They pass stories on to their impressionable kids, and the more impressionable they are, the more they believe it. Those kinds of people are more likely to see what they believe. That's some fundamental reasoning for you. Now on to something less obvious. Scientists argue that we've evolved as a species to hallucinate just a little bit to be ready for outside threats. When you're walking through a dark forest, you might be able to deceive yourself into thinking you see or hear something unusual. One scientist put it like this. When you're in such a situation, you have a couple of choices. Do you think, ah, it's nothing, and head toward the noise? Or do you take the possible threat on board and walk slowly away from the noise? He said humans have evolved to convince ourselves the threat is real, that the noise or movement was real. That way, we stay safe. The professor called it the better safe than sorry kind of thinking, which might mean we deceive ourselves a lot, but we might avoid getting stabbed in the woods because of it. The downside is we tell our friends dubious wild stories about stuff we experienced when we were alone. It goes deeper than this, though. There was a study published in 1993 titled Bereavement Among Elderly People, Grief Reactions, Post-Bereavement Hallucinations, and Quality of Life. It studied 14 men and 36 women all in their 70s who had just lost their partner. The researchers wrote half of the subjects felt the presence of the deceased, illusions. About one-third reported seeing, hearing, and talking to the deceased, hallucinations. The scientists didn't even discuss the possibility that these people had seen a ghost, saying what they saw was a manifestation of instantaneous relief from painful grief symptoms. Nonetheless, if Grandma Gladys starts telling everyone she was visited by Grandpa Bob last night, and they talked about how much they both missed Monday Night Bingo, someone in that family might believe she'd seen a ghost. A lot of families might not be too familiar with grief-related hallucinations. Even if they are, they might not believe in them if they've been conditioned enough as children to be superstitious. According to Christopher French, a professor of psychology and the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit, humans hallucinate a lot. He's talking about the phenomenon of sleep paralysis, which is when humans become conscious while they're still partly in the REM dream state. 30 to 40 percent of people worldwide have reported this experience, but around 5 percent of people have experienced something much worse. That is feeling like they're paralyzed and seeing something terrible next to them or over them. It might sometimes feel like this being is sitting on top of them, maybe even choking them. This presence has been called the night hag or the old hag in some cultures. In some Asian countries, it's often referred to as a ghost pressing down on someone's chest. The Vietnamese word for it literally means held down by a ghost, and the Chinese word means ghost pressing on body. Sometimes the presence is felt with sounds such as ghostly whispering, while others have even reported a feeling of being pulled from their beds. Scientists say that what happens during one of those episodes likely has its foundation in culture, meaning the sufferers see or hear what they are culturally accustomed to. Americans don't generally have nightmares about Madame Khoi Khoi, a ghost that Nigerian and other African kids might dream up. When people find themselves conscious but unable to move and still in a dream state, their brains become hyper-vigilant. The person is shocked, scared, anxious, and so their dream or nightmare conjures up the most frightening things. It's the scientific belief that this is one of the primary reasons we have ghosts in our cultures. We literally dreamed them into reality. Ok, on to something else. Ghosts have been exploited in many cultures in order to keep kids safe from danger. The boogeyman in western cultures can be very helpful to parents. Tell your kids a boogeyman could be lurking around in the streets at night or in the nearby woods, and that might make children not wander off too far. On the other hand, just tell a kid not to do something and their curiosity or rebelliousness might get the better of them. While not a ghost, Santa rewards nice children with gifts, and the tooth fairy leaves cash under your pillow if you don't make too much noise about losing a tooth. Add this to the devil and the boogeyman and it's no wonder paranoid maniacs walk the streets. Anyway, remember we talked about the Asian ghost Pret, or sometimes called Preta? You'll hear stories about this unfriendly ghost in most Asian nations. In Thailand, Pret is very tall and skinny, ugly, and always very, very hungry. Hence, it's sometimes called the hungry ghost. It also has a tiny mouth like the eye of a needle, but a large stomach that can't ever be filled. It roams around feeling starved to death, sometimes with only dead bodies and trash to see. 
It's a miserable world that Pret lives in. One Thai person talking about the ghost said she was told by her parents when she was a kid that if she was ever rude to them or basically did anything they didn't like, she would be born again as Pret. She said this scared her to death when she was growing up in the 90s. She's still scared of Pret now even though she's university educated, well traveled and works for an international company. Pret is ingrained in her brain and she knows that she seems silly to some people. She can't forget what her parents used to say to her when she was a kid. Something along the lines of, be careful if you're bad to your mom or pop, you'll become a Pret after you die. The problem is, if your parents tell such scary stories, they might create a kind of neurosis in the kids that carries through to an older age. There are plenty of ties that in adulthood don't feel comfortable being alone, but that is a curse for many people all over Asia, such as the power of ghost stories. It's also worth noting here that some western studies have shown that fewer students who study subjects that involve a lot of critical thinking believe in ghosts. With that in mind, Thailand's education system has been criticized for decades for not embracing critical thinking. That's another reason why ghosts are still here, there, and everywhere. It's also why people can be too fast to believe they saw a face or a body in something when there's nothing to see. Pareidolia is the phenomenon of humans seeing an object in something when it isn't there. Sometimes we make something seem human when it isn't human at all, which is a type of anthropomorphization. We're sure you've all seen those ghost photos that appear online that seem to titillate the tabloid media, but more often than not, we're trying too hard to see something or someone has just doctored the photos. People have seen Jesus in a piece of toast, and that's why we might sometimes see ghosts when we're just looking at random messiness. Scientists say the human brain can see faces and things incredibly quickly. Yet again, we impose patterns on things and give them agency, just as Dr. Shermer said. All the time we are awake, we're taking in an incredible amount of information and the brain can't pay attention to everything, otherwise there would be data overload. One expert told Scientific American, the vast majority of perception is the brain filling in the gaps. The brain can create a picture that isn't there, which is why you might think you saw a ghostly face when in fact if you'd had taken the time to look harder what you saw was a plastic bag blown against a moonlit branch. It's the same with words. You've all heard those songs that tell you to listen for the wrong lyrics. Once you try to hear the wrong words, you actually do hear them. That can happen when you're trying to hear language in ghostly incoherent audio. Scientists call this electronic voice phenomenon. We might also sometimes get poisoned and actually trip balls, as the saying goes. This happened in 1951 in France in a small village called Pont Saint-Esprit. Around 230 people became very sick after eating the same bread, aka the cursed bread. Some vomited and were bedbound, some died, and some experienced extraordinary hallucinations. This is what the local mayor said at the time. I've seen healthy men and women suddenly become terrorized, ripping their bedsheets, hiding themselves beneath their blankets to escape hallucinations. He recounted how people thought tigers were eating them. Or as one guy said, I am dead and my head is made of copper and I have snakes in my stomach and they are burning me. In this case, seeing a ghost drift past a tree was not much of a big deal. Five people died while others came close to death trying to escape their hallucinations by jumping out of windows or into the river. The blame was put on the naturally occurring fungus ergot, which in 1938 the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman used to make LSD. Still, even a massive dose of LSD would not bring on that kind of madness, not in so many people at the same time. Something messed up happened, but what we don't exactly know. Whether it was ergot or even if the CIA had a hand in the mass poisoning is still up for debate, but what's certain is humans throughout history have certainly had some mind-bending trips when they didn't sign up for it. Some scholars think such hallucinations were behind great art, poetry, or even religious experiences. It's possible some people have seen ghosts when under the influence of something they mistakenly ate, and those experiences were passed down in stories through the ages. But what about people who say they feel ghosts are around them all the time, you know? Those folks who say to you, I see dead people, they exist, although they're more likely to tell you that they can't see anything but just know a ghostly presence is next to them. Dr. Giulio Rognini from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology was very interested in meeting some of those people. In 2014, he invited them to his lab to do some tests. He didn't really believe they were experiencing something supernatural, but he wanted to find out what was happening to them. He told the BBC, what is astonishing is that they frequently report that the movements they're doing or the posture they're assuming at a specific moment is replicated by the presence. So if the patient is sitting, they feel the presence is sitting. If they're standing, the presence is standing, and so on. Let that sink in. Imagine for a second how people might have reacted to these folks a couple of centuries ago, or even now in places where logical positivism at times has less sway than superstition. Rojnini took 12 of those people and used MRI technology to scan their brains. 
He found that they all had damage to parts of the brains responsible for dealing with space, movement, and self-awareness. He then took 48 healthy people who never had a supernatural experience in their life, and he freaked the hell out of them. First, he blindfolded them and connected their finger to a machine. Behind them was a robot that had a metal finger on the person's back. The doctor told each participant to move their finger, and when they did, the robot finger made exactly the same movement on the person's back. They were aware that what they did with their finger would result in the same shape being drawn behind them. That all went fine. It wasn't fine, though, when the doctor started messing with the timing of the robot finger. He delayed the action by a tiny bit, so it drew after the person had moved their hand. The time difference was imperceptible to the participant. This, he said, would replicate the brain damage the other people had. What is remarkable is that when this happened, the people started saying something was in the room with them. They were sure there was something, with the participants saying they felt four people around them. Two of them demanded the doctor take off the blindfold. Now frightened, they refused to do another experiment. The changing of the time messed with their brain. The robot finger didn't correspond to what the brain was telling them was real. Everything was out of whack, and that made them think something else was in the room with them. That is just how the people with the damaged brains felt most of the time. When they feel another person next to them, it's just themselves, but they perceive it to be another person since part of their brain is out of whack. You know where you're sitting now and where your arms and legs are, but just imagine if your brain told you everything was a millisecond behind. There would be another person next to you. Humans with damaged brains likely have been experiencing this kind of thing and talking about it since they learned to string sentences together. This and much more we've talked about today has given rise to the existence of ghosts. Or maybe we haven't managed to convince you of that. Now you need to watch the true story of the Enfield Poltergeist, or have a look at this.